This particular Anne Klebanski visiting lecture is called A New Technology to Monitor the Fetus. We have a guest all the way from Australia. So I guess it's like, what, the middle of the night? <laughs> but she's wide awake. So thank you, Fiona. In case you don't know about our Anne Klebanski Visiting Scholar Award, it was created during COVID-19 in recognition that that pandem pandemic disproportionately affected women who often ended up with additional childcare and household responsibilities due to everyone being sequestered at home. In general, women have been less likely to be a visiting professor because of challenges related to travel if they have children. However, what we realized is that because of COVID-19 restricted, everything was going restrictions, everything was going virtual. So it created this wonderful opportunity to find ways for our women faculty to present at the national and international level, as well as getting mentoring and networking opportunities. So our Center for Faculty Development Director, Miriam Radella created this program and named it after Anne Klebanski, who was one of her mentors and is currently the president and CEO of Mass General Brigham, former director of the CFD, who established a wonderful, another wonderful award, the Claflin Awards for women faculty, as well as the MGH Backup Center. Here are our scholars, the first group, and the second group, and the current group. We have the, the AK Visiting Scholar Program includes what we call champions. These are senior faculty members from MGH who voluntarily give their time to mentor and sponsor the winners of the award applications by finding them wonderful opportunities to speak in national and international locations virtually. And this particular series, the visiting lecture series was created because we realized what happened was is that the professors that our professors were contacting were saying, oh my gosh, what an amazing program. I would love for my young faculty to have an opportunity to speak. So we came up with this idea. Originally it was it was always a duo, and sometimes it still is, of connecting our scholar with a young faculty member from the institution in which our scholar had been invited to, to work together to create a joint talk. But sometimes we have invited the outside scholar to give a talk by that person's self, which is the case today. But ultimately what happens is, this is a way to foster collaborations, this is a way to, in, to move forward the careers of women around the globe. It's just a wonderful opportunity. Here are some of the places that our scholars have been invited to and other scholars have come from to speak virtually at MGH. You can see there are many across our country and the world. And University of Melbourne is highlighted. Now I can hand it over to Dr. Morris. Hi, thank you. Yeah, it's my honor to, do, to introduce today's speaker, Fiona Brownfoot. She got her medical degree from the University of Adelaide and did her training at the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. She then completed her PhD at the University of Melbourne, where she stayed on. She's currently an associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology, where she serves as the head of obstetric diagnostics and therapeutics. She's the leader of a large research group and has published 70 manuscripts in prestigious journals. She's won several awards, including Newcastle Reproduction Emerging Research Leader Award and the SRI Laxmi Baxi New Investigator Award, among, among many others. She's the chief investigator on several large research grants. It's quite impressive to read her CV. She has studied the use of metformin to prolong gestation in women with preeclampsia and also the mechanism by which it does so. Today, she's gonna to talk to us about a new technology to monitor the fetus. And Dr. Brownfoot, I'll turn it to you. Fabulous, thanks very much, Mary. Um, and I'd really like to thank Brenda, Mary, and Anne for giving me this incredible opportunity to speak to you all today. Yeah, so again, I'd just like to highlight just what a privilege uh, it is to be speaking to you all today. And now when I was uh, 
preparing for this talk, I thought that I would focus on um, on novel fetal monitoring. Then when I read the, my bio was about um, preeclampsia therapeutics, I thought that I would um, incorporate that within the talk as well, given that it was an, an hour talk. Um, so my name is Fiona Broutford. I'm a clinician scientist. So I'm an obstetrician and I work at a tertiary centre here in Melbourne at the Mercy Hospital for Women. So that means that we have both the neonatal intensive care unit and ICU, and we resuscitate babies from 22 to 23 weeks, so just the cusp of viability, and um, around 400 grams. We're a referral centre for, for our state. I'm also a scientist, and I completed a laboratory-based PhD looking at um, small molecules to potentially treat preeclampsia, which is a topic that I still continue to research to this day. Now, conflicts of interest. I, we are um, looking at developing a novel fetal monitoring device, and if successful, we're looking at commercialising it through um, through a startup called Carly Healthcare. But I'm not going to focus at all on that aspect of it. It's just going to be all about the research, given this is a research talk today. Now, the main reason I went into obstetrics and gynaecology is because of moments like this, where the bulk of our patients have very healthy pregnancies, very healthy deliveries. Um, and it's just a, a pleasure and, um, and a joy to, to be in the moment with our patients. But perhaps it was more outcomes like this and outcomes like this, the little lives, um, that really drove me from the clinic then into the laboratory in order to search for possible treatments to improve um, outcomes for our women that do end up having pregnancy complications. I now have a lab of around 10 um, and that incorporates, we're a multidisciplinary group incorporating both clinicians, scientists and engineers, all focused on developing uh, treatments and technologies in order to improve pregnancy outcomes. And the two main topics um, and projects that I'll speak about today is looking at treatments for preeclampsia, as well as um, novel devices that we're looking at um, in order to improve pregnancy outcomes. So first of all, given that this is the way that I started in science, I thought that I'd focus on treatments for preeclampsia. So this RCOG guideline really highlighted the deficiency of, of novel therapeutics in our field. It highlighted that there's currently a drought of new drug development within obstetrics. Obstetrics had fewer drugs in development than some single diseases, such as Crohn's disease. And whilst there was 1,636 drugs under development for neurological disease, this compared to only 17 for maternal health. So this really prompted us to then go back into the laboratory, and, and this is really what drove me from the, from the clinic into the lab, to think about a treatment for preeclampsia. So preeclampsia is a very common condition in pregnancy affecting three to 8% of pregnant patients. It's, um, it's a disease that has high morbidity and mortality for, for babies born at that cusp of gestation. Unfortunately, there is no medical treatment and the only way that we can stop disease progression is to deliver our patients, which if this occurs preterm can lead to lifelong morbidity um, for that child due to prematurity, including um, eye, gut, lung, um, and as well as cerebral palsy uh, complications. So in order to develop a therapeutic, we need to know a bit about the pathogenesis of disease. Now, preeclampsia is thought to occur due to the increased release of antiangiogenic factors. And these include soluble flint and soluble endoglin, as well as other cytokines um, and inflammatory mediators. For reasons that are still unknown, there's an upregulation of the production of these proteins by the, the placenta that then leads to preeclampsia. We think that hypoxia and inflammation really drive the production of these soluble factors. These factors then spill into the maternal bloodstream, leading to widespread vascular endothelial dysfunction as they sequester PLGF and VEGF, leading to an unstable endothelium. This then manifests in all of the signs and symptoms that we see in our patients, hypertension, proteinuria, and then also other multi-system organ involvement, including liver, uh, abnormal liver function, as well as can progress to eclampsia and seizures. So perhaps a therapeutic would target both soluble flit and soluble endoglin secretion, as well as vascular endothelial dysfunction. 
So I was really tasked in my PhD to look at a molecule, pravastatin, as a possible treatment for preeclampsia. Now, pravastatin is a medication that's used to treat high cholesterol. And it was discovered by a group in the UK as a potential therapeutic for preeclampsia by the SCFR Med Group. They'd looked at this medication using cell lines. And the real focus of my PhD was using a novel um, assay pipeline using primary human tissues, primary human placenta, which we're very privileged to have um, wide access to, given that we are located at a hospital, um, to see what effect pravastatin might have. And pravastatin had a modest effect on the secretion of soluble foot and soluble endoglin, and a modest effect on, uh, this, on vascular endothelial dysfunction. I was also tasked with then taking it to the clinic and seeing, doing a small pilot study to see whether or not it could indeed treat preeclampsia. Now, a big problem with pravastatin is it's currently a category X drug and it was near impossible to get patients to, um, or patients just weren't interested in consenting to a trial with a drug that um, was from a category X, even though pravastatin itself is, was shown to be safer than the other statins um, within, that, within that group. So it really did get us thinking, we needed something else. We needed another, another type of therapy that pregnant women would be happy to take that wouldn't have those potential adverse um, effects on the fetus. And this is really where metformin comes in. So it was on speaking widely to clinicians from many various fields, as well as reading widely within the literature that really did stimulate a thought that potentially metformin might be a treatment for preeclampsia. So it was really in reading the epidemiological cancer literature that led to this discovery. So in, in the cancer field, metformin has been shown to prolong um, life expectancy. And it's thought to do so by blocking hypoxic, um, hypoxic pathways, uh, particularly HIF1-alpha, which is a transcription factor known to be a master regulator of hypoxic gene um, regulation, and it's upregulated within tissues that are, are hypoxic. Metformin blocks this, and that's how it's thought to reduce um, metastasis and, and prolong life within the cancer field. Now, there were a lot of similarities with this and preeclampsia, whereby HIF1-alpha is also thought to play a central role within preeclampsia. So I initially thought potentially we should trial metformin as, as a therapy, and we already had this uh, in this laboratory pipeline using human tissues in which to trial the medication. So firstly, in this laboratory-based pipeline using primary tissues, we initially test the placenta, um, both explants, which is where we cut the placenta up into multiple small pieces. And we also isolate primary human trophoblasts. So this is a process that takes about six hours to do. And it's a process whereby um, I thought, my goodness, I think I'll just go back to the clinic given it takes six hours and it is far easier to deliver a baby or do a hysterectomy than perform these primary human trophoblasts. Um, so initially we obtained both explants as well as primary human trophoblasts. And this is because they are a pure culture um, and far easier to perhaps understand than um, the far more varied results we got from placental explants. And we look at protein secretion, so those antiangiogenic factors, soluble flit and soluble endoglin, and also mRNA expression. So we know that soluble flit um, is formed of multiple splice variants, and the most important ones in preeclampsia is soluble flit E15A and soluble flit I13. And when we treated our primary trophoblast with increasing doses of metformin, we saw a dose-dependent significant reduction in soluble flit secretion. And this was the same effect, uh, and it had the same effect on our preeclamptic explants, whereby we saw a significant reduction in soluble flit secretion. We also saw a simi similar effect on that other antiangiogenic molecule, soluble endoglin, whereby there was around a 50% reduction in soluble endoglin secretion from explants taken from women um, that, that had been diagnosed with preeclampsia. So next we questioned why metformin might be exerting this effect. And we initially explored HIF1-alpha as uh, 
as the possible reason. However, this didn't really seem to have an effect on soluble flit. So again, delving into that um, multidisciplinary literature, it became clear that metformin, which is a medication used to treat diabetes, um, and it is known to be safe in pregnancy, and, and it is used to treat gestational diabetes, um, blocks complex one of the mitochondrial electron transport chain. So the mitochondrial electron transport chain includes five complexes and it shuffles electrons through these complexes in order to form ATP, uh, whereby it goes from ADP to ATP. And metformin blocks that complex one. So next we looked to see whether or not other complex one or complex three inhibitors, including rotenone and antimycin, might have a similar effect on soluble flit secretion um, from primary trophoblasts. So again, we isolated our human primary trophoblast and on application of both rotenone, a complex one inhibitor and antimycin, a complex three inhibitor, we saw a significant reduction in soluble flit secretion. So the next question we had was, well, if metformin blocks complex one, if we could activate the mitochondrial electron transport chain further down, um, Further down, so if we could activate complex two by adding a substrate for complex two, such as succinate, could we switch that mitochondrial electron transport chain back on in the presence of metformin and reverse the effect metformin was having on soluble flit? And indeed, we found that when we just added succinate alone, there was no change to soluble flit secretion. In the presence of metformin alone, we saw again that significant reduction in soluble flit secretion by about 50%. And with the ad addition of succinate, we were able to reverse the effect metformin had on soluble flit secretion and rescue that soluble flit production, indicating that potentially metformin is acting by um, its effect on the complex, on complex one and blocking complex one and its effect on the mitochondrial electron transport chain. We also explored the effect uh, or the complexes within um, patients that had um, pre within the placentas from patients that had preterm preeclampsia. And when we looked at complex two, we found that there was a significant increase in activity um, of complex two within preeclampsia. Again, just uh, more information that uh, potentially impacting that um, the mitochondria is may in fact be a treatment for preeclampsia. So this gave us a re really encouraging results to then look to see what effect metformin might be having on the endothelium, given that it is damage to the endothelium that then leads to all of the complications that we see with preeclampsia. We isolate Huvex from the placenta and we also obtain omental arteries. And we do this from, um, from obtaining omentum from women at caesarean section. We then induce dysfunction in both our cells, our Huvex, as well as our omental arteries by adding TNF-alpha or soluble flit, preeclamptic serum or trophoblast conditioned media. And the cellular, cellular effects that we're looking at is to see whether or not there might be um, effects on vascular cell adhesion molecule one um, and also monocyte adhesion. So these are both um, elevated within preeclampsia. And the functional effects we're looking at is migration of Huvex, angiogenesis, and we do this using a omental artery assay to see the outgrowth of that of vessels, um, and vasodilation, which we use using a my, wire myography, um, and whether or not those omental arteries are able to dilate within the presence um, of dysfunction whilst being treated with small molecules. So in preeclampsia, we know that there's an upregulation of vascular cell adhesion molecule one. And this then causes platelets to bind to the endothelium, leading to a big vascular um, and inflammatory mesh over the endothelium. Red blood cells then pass through and can hemolyze, and that then leads to the hemolysis of, that we see within our preeclamptic patients. So we were interested to see if metformin could indeed reduce that vascular um, cell endothelial um, one molecule. So we did this by obtaining our Huvex. We treated our Huvex with the cytokine that's known to be upregulated in preeclampsia, TNF-alpha, and we found a significant reduction in vascular cell adhesion molecule one. We then obtained our omental arteries, and we found that in the presence 
of placental explant media, there was a significant reduction in vascular relaxation. But in the presence of metformin, we saw a similar response um, of dilation, can, a similar response to when we just use normal media with our um, omental arteries, indicating that metformin could rescue the effect that that placental explant media had on vascular relaxation. We also performed an angiogenesis assay whereby we obtained the omental um, artery, which you can see just here, cut it up into very small slices, and then added soluble fit to the omental artery. And as you can see here, with the addition of soluble fit, there's a reduction um, in vascular outgrowth. So you can see in the control picture that there is um, a lot of um, small vessels um, coming from that, that omental artery. And in the presence of metformin, we were able to rescue the effect soluble fit had. So we then published um, this within the American Journal of ONG. And given that metformin was safe and is a safe medication to use in pregnancy, we then proceeded with our collaborators in South Africa to perform a randomised control um, trial assessing whether or not metformin could indeed um, increase the length of gestation of patients with preeclampsia. And I was very, very fortunate to be completing a PhD at the same time as Kathy Kluver, who's this person here, um, was completing a fellowship in maternal fetal medicine at, um, at the Mercy Hospital for Women. And we got, she was asking about my PhD and I was asking about um, her experience in South Africa. And it became quite clear that the burden of disease of preeclampsia is really shouldered in the third world. And um, Kathy has, sees a very high number of patients with preterm preeclampsia, where in South Africa, it is a death sentence. So they don't have the NICUs like we have here. Um, and patients that, um, that birth preterm, you know, under, definitely under 28 weeks, um, those babies just aren't able to survive. So it became very clear that um, potentially running a randomised control trial with Kathy in South Africa uh, was going to be the best way to, um, to both look to see whether or not treating preeclampsia with metformin might improve um, outcomes but also that this is where um, it might have its greatest impact. So we went on with, um, so Kathy completed her PhD with Professor Sue Walker and Professor Stephen Tong here at the University of Melbourne, looking to see whether or not metformin may indeed be a treatment for preeclampsia. She performed a, a phase two randomized control um, trial where she recruited 180 participants, so it was 90 to each arm, uh, and treated women um, with preeclampsia from 26 to 31 plus six weeks gestation diagnosed with preterm preeclampsia. And she randomised patients to three grams of um, oral metformin um, or placebo. So impressively, Kath managed to recruit 180 patients within two years. Um, from one hospital um, at Tigerberg um, within Cape Town in South Africa. And this then led to this publication in the BMJ where indeed we did find that metformin um, led to a seven day prolongation of gestation for women with preterm preeclampsia. And, and in fact, this effect was even more pronounced in women that were able to tolerate that high, the um, the high dose of metformin. We're now progressing this to a phase three clinical trial and it will be a definitive clinical trial whereby um, Cass is looking at recruiting 500 women with preterm preeclampsia to see whether or not metformin indeed um, is, a, is potentially the first um, treatment for preeclampsia. So now I'm gonna shift focus um, to look at novel um, devices in, um, in obstetrics. So I guess the reason um, or how this theme of research came about was really shown um, in this figure here. So this really shows that stillbirth over the last 20 years has really disappointingly remained unchanged. Stillbirth still affects one in 140 uh, families, Australian families, and is potentially one of the most devastating outcomes of pregnancy. 
And look, potentially, a, a one aspect behind this is that um, our fetal monitoring really hasn't changed. So the way we monitor the fetus um, is very similar to how we've been monitoring the fetus for the last 50 years, and that is with a CTG machine. So this here shows the CTG machine. Um, it involves two paddles on the mum's tummy, and um, it utilises ultrasound-based um, technology, whereby that paddle must be immediately over that fetal heart um, in order to generate a fetal heart rate. And we can see a pattern in the fetal heart rate that lets us know if the fetus is coping well with pregnancy, whereby um, the traces look somewhat like this. And we'd call this a very reassuring um, fetal heart rate trace versus a trace like this, which is what we call a non-reassuring um, fetal heart rate trace, whereby there's a reduction in variability. So you, you're not seeing that up and down um, effect on the baseline. It, it's really flat, as well as there's um, decelerations within that trace. And our CTGs and fetal monitoring units look somewhat like this. So this is the whole CTG machine. Um, on the patient, whereby it incorporates these, um, these paddles, which use ultrasound in order to pick up that fetal heart rate. And the monitoring unit looks somewhat like this. It looks like a big computer monitor. And because it is ultrasound based, it's a technology that really can't be miniaturized. Um, patients have come in for their fetal monitoring sessions in units such as this, which is our fetal monitoring unit here at the Mercy. Um, they have to lie down. We have to position the ultrasound over the baby's heart. If the patient moves or the baby moves, then that can lead to signal dropout, um, leading to prolonged time, uh, prolonged sessions of fetal monitoring, as well as in labour, can be very frustrating. Um, as the baby moves down the birth canal, we can um, then lose that fetal heart rate, um, which can be very frustrating and lead to um, complications as clinicians. It makes it very difficult to interpret a trace if there's just um, a lot of fetal, a lot of heart rate dropout within that trace. It's also a technology that can pick up that maternal heart rate. Um, and sometimes we can confuse that maternal heart rate for a fetal heart rate, whereby we think everything's progressing um, okay. And the baby's tolerating either the pregnancy or the labor when in fact it is the mum's heartbeat. So this is what really stimulated this, um, this topic of research, whereby potentially a device which might be wireless and portable um, that might stick on the mum's tummy and have a, um, a monitor that is small and light that might wirelessly transmit to um, a smart device, including a computer or a phone, um, would be the way of fetal monitoring in the future. This might replace CTG in its current form, could be used during pregnancy um, in the hospital setting, um, as well as during labor, whereby you know, minimal fetal heart rate dropout would be the key to this technology, improving, um, in, improving um, a clinician as well as, uh, as, well as patients' uh, involvement with fetal monitoring as well as it's a technology that potentially could be used um, in the home environment for patients requiring very frequent fetal monitoring sessions, given that telehealth has become um, incorporated into our healthcare system following COVID, something that prior to COVID, you know, we'd never really considered. And this is where I got um, talking with engineers at University of Melbourne and Emerson Keenan came and did his PhD with um, both myself as well as um, Professor Palani, who is um, a professor of electrical engineering. And we were really tasked with looking at um, this fetal ECG technology to see whether or not it could be improved and become something that we could incorporate into the clinic. Now, fetal ECG technology has been used before, and this is the Monica system, which was developed in the UK, and it's now um, been bought by um, GE and, and Philips now use this technology. Um, however, as you can see here, there is a huge amount of fetal dropout with, with the Monica system, whereby now this was, um, I think this paper was probably written by engineers, and um, low is actually um, preterm gestation, medium is late preterm gestation and high is term, um, whereby the ability to pick up a fetal heart was 
really only able to happen around 50% of the time. So in Emerson's PhD, we really thought about how can we um, improve that accuracy of fetal ECG so that this technology might be something that could be used in the clinic because at the minute it still um, has such huge dropout rates that it does make it difficult to interpret. Um, developing a portable hardware that might be um, easy and more manageable for patients and then thinking about translating this technology to the clinic. So firstly, let's focus on improving the accuracy of the fetal ECG. So here I'm performing an ultrasound on one of our patients, and this is the raw ECG result that we're getting. Now, it would be very easy, and this technology would just go straight to the clinic if these high peaks here was the fetal ECG um, and the fetal heart rate. And, and when I say the fetal ECG, it's in fact um, using that fetal heart rate to then deliver a trace similar to the CTG that can be interpreted by clinicians. So, but indeed, in fact, the fetal heart rate is, is this one here, which is these far smaller spikes, far more difficult to pick up. Um, and there, as you can see, there's a lot of electrical interference within that, um, within that trace. So firstly, we asked what, what impacts on getting a good fetal heart rate signal. We recruited 100 women and looked at the location of the fetal heart. And in women at term, um, that location of the fetal heart always was around the umbilicus. Um, and regardless of if the, um, if the patient had um, a smaller baby on board or if the patient had a cephalic or transverse or breech baby, so the head being at the top versus at the bottom, the heart always was around the mum's um, umbilicus, which you know, we were hoping that potentially that might change and that might um, give us insights. But um, in fact, in many ways, I guess it's a positive thing is it means that we could design a technology that sits with that fetal heart between um, sensors between, uh, so the fetal heart is between the sensors. Next, thinking about electrical interference. So both internal electrical interference, um, which is things like the mum's heart, the, the mum's electrical um, heart rate, as well as the um, abdominal and um, GIT um, interference, and then also external. So that is, you know, the mobile phones, the power lines, um, and also thinking about the sensor selection algorithm. So um, putting multiple sensors on the mum's tummy and currently um, all of the information goes to produce that fetal heart rate um, trace. Whereas if we could develop an algorithm that selected a sensor to listen to that, contain, that predominantly contain that fetal heart, we might be able to develop a technology that had less interference. So given that we knew whereabouts the fetal heart was on those women at term, the next step was to see how many sensors would be required in order to obtain a highly accurate signal that picked up the fetal heart rate, you know, close to 100% of the time accurately, and that is above 80% of the time that fetal heart rate had to be within 10% of the CTG, and that's the standard um, implied by the FDA. So next we put... 18 sensors over, um, over the maternal abdomen to then work out how many sensors were optimal in order, to, um, in order to obtain a fetal heart rate. And indeed, we found that two sensors just gave uh, a reading that was far too inaccurate. However, when we used six sensors, this gave us a similar accuracy and reliability to when we had the full complement of sensors on the abdomen, indicating that, um, that six sensors was going to be the optimal, um, the optimal number. But we still weren't really impressed with the conventional algorithms that we were using to extract that fetal heart rate. As here you can see, the reliability at times was still, whilst the majority of the time it was around 90%, at times it was still only around 40%. And this is really where deep learning came in. So 
the conventional way that we um, that we develop algorithms in order to obtain a fetal heart rate is to use knowledge. So to exclude um, any electrical interference outside of the um, hertz that the fetal heart rate um, sits at, remove any reoccurring electrical activity that is not similar to the fetal ECG. And that's what we, those were the traditional algorithms we used. But AI really learns from the data. So we give the computer the CTG and we say, can you then pick fetal um, heart rate features from the ECG data to mimic the CTG? And we placed our sensor patch, so of six sensors and, um, and one ground sensor on 52 patients. And we then trained our algorithm on four fifths of the data, um, whereby we used um, one fifth to test the data. And indeed, compared to the traditional algorithms, the deep, deep learning um, algorithms completely outperformed traditional, um, the traditional algorithms to obtain that fetal heart to give us a reliability of 95%, which was significantly different. So to give you an idea of the heart rate trace that we're obtaining, it's very, very similar to the CTG. Just got this on a slight delay. So you can see um, both the traditional um, CTG as well as um, the output that we're getting from our fetal monitoring device. So we became really, and this is just some more, um, some more examples, whereby you can see that we're picking up that heart rate all of the time. Um, and it is very, very similar um, to the CTG output. So we got really excited by this data and thought the next step of this project was to develop portable hardware and a wearable patch um, that contained hardware that is small and light, so around the size of a smartphone, um, would be ideal. And this is a sensor patch that we found um, gave us the optimal readout, which was that 95%. Um, accuracy, whereby there's six sensors and one reference electrode. Um, and this is that we've managed to get the hardware down to the size um, of a phone. Now, of course, this is absolutely research grade and um, miniaturizing that hardware even further is, is the focus going forward, but I, I won't really go into that today. So hopefully we will be able to have fetal monitoring units, not looking like, like this, like our current hospital units, but perhaps looking more like the image on the right where um, patients are able to easily apply the sensor patches. Um, they're able to get up, move around, walk around without any fetal dropout. Um, and in fact, it might even be something that could be used in the home setting. Um, although definitely we are many years away from, from that. So I hope I've shown you that we've really got a strong focus on improving outcomes in pregnancy, both using science-based approaches as well as looking at what novel engineering approaches um, there are that might make devices that weren't possible even five years ago something that we can progress forward with to try and bring more um, babies home safely. And I am super grateful um, for all of the international um, experience and, um, and collaborators and people that I've been able to meet. Um, I, I did the FUR course, the Frontiers in Reproduction course in um, Woods Hole, just outside of, um, of Boston. And that was just an incredible course that really set me um, on this pathway to being a clinician scientist. Um, and with that, I'd love to thank um, all of our collaborators in our team. So in particular, um, Dr. Emerson Keenan, who's an electrical engineer, um, who's really progressed forward with that fetal ECG work. Professor Stephen Tong, um, who was my PhD supervisor, who initially got me interested in um, or um, started uh, on that science-based journey. Um, and Professor Tuay Cacciolino, um, and collaborators, Professor Maramus, Maramusu Palanaswamy, who's an electrical engineer, and all of our funding bodies, including the NHMRC, the Norman Baisha Medical Research Foundation. Um, and I would love to thank all of you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. It's been a real honour and pleasure.
Thank you, Fiona. Oh, that was thank you for being here. We got yeah. two great talks. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I thought I'd better incorporate that prayer clamps here, given that you know my whole bio was about prayer clamps. Yeah. Yeah, that was great. Um, there are some questions in the chat, so I'll start with those. Um, one of them, I think you've partially answered. Um, the question is, it would be helpful to show the effect of metformin on proteins other than, than S-flit and s -ing. So as to understand, is this a specific inhibition of these mediators or just generalized protein inhibition? And I think some of your experiments might have answered that, but I'll allow you to. Yeah, thank you very much. It is such a good question and it's absolutely something that we are further looking into um, to see whether or not metformin might also reduce those cytokines and inflammatory mediators and perhaps um, a, a very interesting point of our metformin clinical trial we did take a cohort of blood samples from our patients um, both those with placebo as well as those on metformin and guess what soluble flick did not change which was very disappointing to us but it shows us that there is much we don't know about preeclampsia and metformin is absolutely likely having um, a, an effect outside of just those an angiogenic factors. Have you thought about using it prophylactically in people? I mean, I, I, I know these trials are still, still go ongoing, but in people who have a history, would you use it prophylactically prior to them developing um, preeclampsia? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, Mary. Thanks for the question. Um, we're currently uh, we are currently organising a, um, a prophylactic trial um, on metformin. Mm. Great. And Dr. Ecker has his hand up. Thanks, Mary, and thank you especially, Dr. Brownfoot. It's great to get to meet you virtually, having read a bunch of your papers and one of the maternal fetal medicine folks here. I want to, I guess, pile on a little bit to Mary's question. You know um, from others' work that SFLIT um, levels go up early in pregnancy in those who will uh, eventually develop preeclampsia. And yes. um, that um, you've demonstrated in your work that metformin may uh, knock down expression, but may also have an effect on the endothelium itself. And so I wonder a little bit as you see prolongation of pregnancy and the second paper you talked about, if we're really treating the underlying disease, the remodeling that has already happened from the S-flit, or we're just kind of taking care of the symptoms and how that might play out and looking at effects on the fetus um, and, and really um, making folks better. Um, yeah, absolutely. No, it's a great question, Jeffrey. Yeah, thank you very much. And I've also read some of your papers as well, so it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think there's much that, you know, that there's still many, many unknowns. And further identifying how metformin is exerting its effect will give us insights as to how it's implicating that pathogenesis of disease. And it's not all about soluble flit and hemoglobin, clearly given that in those patients there wasn't a change Um compared to placebo. Um, but I absolutely think you're right that we do need to further delve into the pathogenesis to see how it's how it's affecting the disease process. Mm. Well, I'll pile onto that question a little bit more too. Um, I wonder though, is if if you did give it prophylactically, um, if you would see a difference in S-flit eventually that maybe the cats just aren't, at least some of the cats are already out of the bag um, and that seven day window isn't enough to really see a difference. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think I think one of the big or unknowns for preeclampsia research is, you know, has has the train left the station? Is it impossible to bring it back? Um, and and I guess that's that was a, a big question for us. Like is it even possible to treat preeclampsia? Um, however, seeing this prolongation in gestation does give us um, some confidence that you know this this is the right thing to be doing um, and right thing to continue to explore and I don't think metformin's the end I'm you know um, the Karamanchi team are looking at siRNAs against soluble flit there's um, there's teams looking at um, you know uh, different inflammatory mediators in fact you know I myself have looked at sulfur salazine so I think that it's an encouraging finding to spur the field on to look for therapeutics for preeclampsia. I don't think it's it's the final um, 
the final piece of the puzzle or the end of that story. Mm. On your um, explant tissue, have you thought about doing single cell sequencing or anything like that to look at differences in gene expression? Yeah, absolutely. I think that is absolutely the next step. Um, and we were considering doing that on the patient samples as well. Mm. Um, and going into this next RCT, um, we've just come back from South Africa because we just found that the samples, the, the collection was a bit different to how we did the collection. So, um, yeah, I think that the next lot of samples will be very robust and, um, you know, we'll be in a state where um, cell se sequencing will be the way to go. Yeah, it's become a much cheaper and robust technology these days that, you know, you can basically send it off to somebody to have it done as opposed to doing it yourself and get great data. Absolutely. Mm. Um, are there any other questions about the uh, metformin preeclampsia? There are some. There is at least one question about the um, the monitoring. So I'll move on to the monitoring. Uh, um, let's see. Does the ECG monitor have the capacity to correlate with uterine contractions? It does. Yes, and it picks up the contractions very, very easily. Um, which is, yeah, which is one, yeah, excellent. Mm. Great. Does anybody have any other questions? Just raise your hand. Well, Anne, I will turn it back over to you. And thank you so much, uh, Fiona. This was wonderful. Oh, thanks so much, Mary and Anne. It was nice to get you back. You were here. It was. It was so lovely catching up. Mm. Thank you so much, Fiona, for for coming, so to speak, across the waves from far away to talk to us about this fascinating topic. A lot of it went over my head, but um, I'm not a scientist. It was still it was still really interesting, I have to say. So thank you all for coming, everybody who has come, and you, if you need Dr. Brownfoot's contact information, let the CFD know. And I wish all of you a wonderful rest of the day and you know, the long day for, for Fiona. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bye, everybody. Thank you.